with prayer. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this time of worship. God, help us as we study your word uh, to, God, receive from you this morning. God, we're not interested in hearing a man. Uh, I'm not interested uh, in hearing a man. We want you. Jesus, would you speak to us through your word this morning? Father, James is a challenging letter. We pray for your help as we continue to go through it, God. Uh, Lord, let it be life-changing for us. All this we ask in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, we're continuing in our study of the epistle of James. And as we get going, I had something interesting happen to me this week. If you notice in your bulletin, you have, uh, uh, it, it's written in red letters, I believe, written in red. It doesn't mean it's the words of Jesus, but it's, it's Carlin. It's the words of Carlin in your bulletin. Well, is it crackling again? Is it? Oh. Test one, two, one, two, one, two. Is it, is it crackling? Is it a little bit? All right, I'll use the other mic. I'm so, you, I'm so spoiled uh, with... Uh, the wireless here. Let's see. Is that better? Test one, two, one, two. And we'll get that sorted out. That happened to me in the first service, too. All right. Can we do something with this EQ, though? It's all set up for Carlin, and she has a much nicer voice than I do. Um, it'll be a distraction to me. But as we get study, uh, as we get started here with our study this morning. Uh, I got an email from one of you this past week regarding the name of this epistle and the length of this epistle. And I welcome anyone, if you have questions, if you have comments, I want to hear from you. These emails do get to me, and I review them and I take them seriously. But uh, this email was regarding the name uh, of the, this epistle and the length. Now, I'm not going to refer, how many know there's a lot of information out there these days? There's a ton of stuff. You can get in some wild stuff. Some of it, you know, it's, it, you can't take it seriously or you can't hammer down on it. And I found, that the, uh, I found that the length of the epistle, a lot of the debate was circumstantial. So I'm just going to stick with what is in the canon of Scripture. But, but the name of the epistle, on the other hand, that was an interesting investigation. What do we call this letter? What do we call it? James, or studying James. It is the epistle of James. Uh, if you look, I use a blue letter Bible. How many, uh, how many use that, that tool, blue letter Bible? It's a great tool. If you haven't found it, it's easy. Blue let, just get in, uh, go, go to Google, Google and search uh, blue letter Bible. I think it's .com or .org. What is it? Either way, there's an app for it. Yeah, I just, I've, I put it in so much, I don't type .com or .org anymore. It just, it just brings it up. But Blue Letter Bible, it's a great tool because it allows you to see the Greek um, alongside of the English. And so it's very useful. Um, many times you see that uh, in its translation into English, you really have lost a lot of the, uh, the uh, depth and the beauty of the words. And so a uh, great tool, but um, it was brought to my attention that the Greek word for James, he introduces himself in the beginning of this letter. He says, James, a servant of, right? Now, if you look at, in the, if you look at the original Greek for the, the name James, it's Jacobus. Jacobus, all right? Now, the, as, you fur, as you look at that, clo I'm, I'm going to give you the nutshell version of this because it's a, it's a rabbit trail. It's not really the point of today's message, but I find it interesting. Um, Jacobus is the Hellenized form of the Greek word Jacob. What does that sound like? Okay. Uh, Jacobus is the Hellenized version of the word Jacob. Now, there are, other Jake, there are Jacobs in the New Testament, and they didn't Hellenize all of them. So there are three Jacobs that they Hellenized in the New Testament. James, the son of Zebedee, James, the son of Alphaeus, and James, the half-brother of Jesus, all of which most likely are Jacob. Jacobus is the Hellenized version of the Greek form Jacob, which is the direct translation of the Hebrew word Jacob. And so it might be the epistle of, Ye of Jacob. All right? Uh, I just find that interesting how people might say, well, how in the world did we get from Jacob to James? Well, that's a long story. But let me give it to you in a nutshell. All right? 
the, the, the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew text, eventually, I'm not going to give you dates and times, but it was translated into Latin. When it was translated into Latin, Jacobus underwent a pronunciation change. It went from Jacobus, Jacob, say Jacobus, to Jacobus. All right? A change, a pronunciation change, that's a big deal when you start saying it differently. Because as more translators work on the text, things begin to change when it comes to, a, in, in particular, a name. And so you have Jacob in Greek changed into, or Jacob in Hebrew changed to Jacob in Greek, cha- Hellenized into Jacobus, all right? And then in Latin, Jacobus, and then the French came along, and they got the Latin translation of the Greek Septuagint, and they truncated Jacobus into Jaimes. So then the English came along, and they took Jaimes, and they translated it into James. That's where we get James from. And so you have James is the English version of the, the French word Jaimes, and Jaimes is the French truncated version of the Latin word Jacobus, and Jacobus is the, is the Latin version of the Hellenized Greek word Jacobus, which is Jacob, which is Hebrew Jacob, yeah, in a nutshell, all right? And so at the end of the day, James is likely Jacob, but regardless, we're talking about the half-brother of Jesus, all right, and, and we're not, the, the fact that we call it the epistle of James, that was kind of a, a quick trail down how we got to, from Jacob to James, but it does not, it does not uh, delegitimize the powerful content of this letter. And just to cut down on confusion, we're going to keep calling it James, all right, because I'll never be able to process that uh, as we move through this, as we move through this letter. So we're going to keep calling it the epistle of James, and I'm going to refer to him as James, but now you know It was probably Jacob, all right? But this goes to show you, church, you should never stop learning. You should never stop studying the Scriptures. I have heard from time to time, Pastor, I've heard it all. And when people say that, I've heard it all, my immediate response down in here is, you've heard nothing. Because if you you think you've heard it all, you've really not been paying attention. Because the, the Scriptures are alive. And they have something to teach us every time we open the book. It doesn't matter if you have, you have read it a hundred times. It doesn't matter. God is something new for you to discover. Even if it is a name. And so thank you for sending that email in. Uh, we do look at those. And I study them. And I appreciate your, your comments and your questions. All right. Well, last week, thank you. It, you never want to send a, a preacher down a rabbit trail. We have, we have the, that, that is a, it's not a spiritual gift, but we just do that automatically. And so thank you for that, uh, that rabbit trail. But interesting stuff. But last week we learned that we must have our minds right when enduring trials. When we go through trials, you've got to have your head in the right place. If you want to come out on the other side of that trial, a better person and not a worse person. How many want to emerge better? Right? You want to come out a better person than you went in. You want to come out of the trial more steadfast, more resilient, more faithful than you went in. We also saw that the proof of whether or not you've emerged from those trials better off is often revealed in the way you treat other people. Now, there are there are many different indications of whether you've emerged better or worse, but we'll just focus on this one. How you treat other people is a great indicator of whether or not the, the trial in your life had a profoundly good effect on you and not a bad effect on you. For example, if you are a person who tears others down, you are vengeful, you are bitter, you are easily offended, I can say confidently to you this morning that you have emerged worse off than you went in. Now, if you are a person who tends to show people grace, why? Because you've received grace. And so now you give grace. You're not easily offended. You are quick to forgive. If that's you, then you have emerged from the trials of life better off than you went in. Do you understand, church? And these next verses, James arms us with a bit more information that is going to help us discern and appreciate what we're going through. 
How many wish you know? It's like, man, I wish I knew why I was going through what I'm going through. How many wish you knew that information, had that information? Okay, why, God, am I going through this? You rarely get the answer to that question. As a believer, you don't get to know why you're in the trial you're in. All you need to know, and the only information you're provided, is that God wants to work in that trial in you to build you up into the person he wants you to be. And church, that needs to be enough. We don't get all the answers on this side of eternity. And that, that's just something I have to go, okay, Lord, I don't like it, but I surrender to the, that reality. I don't get to know why. I just have to know who's in control. Amen? God is in control. But James arms, arms us with a bit more information in these next verses. And so look at verse 9 with me. J- James chapter 1, verse 9. It says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also the rich man, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. You know, the Apostle Paul echoes this teaching as he as he illustrates to us how he has learned to be content no matter what he's facing in life. You know that text in Philippians chapter 4, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That doesn't mean you can do anything through Christ. If you read the context of that passage, you learn what Paul is saying. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's talking about contentment. I can be content in any situation because Christ is in me. And so Paul says, I, I've learned to, 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 to be content whether I'm poor or I'm rich. I've learned to be content uh, if I'm naked or clothed. I've learned to be content if I am satisfied or if I go hungry. I've learned to be content no matter what I'm going through. And so we see this reality echoed in This epistle, truly profound teaching. It's one we all need this morning because it covers everyone. It's talking to each one of us. You're going to find yourself in this equation. He deals with the lowly or the humble in circumstances and the rich. Now, I don't know where you uh, are this morning. I don't know what your wealth looks like. I don't know how much you have. I don't know how lowly you are this morning. God knows, and and this is talking to all of us. First, he says, He deals with the lowly. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Lowly means from humble circumstances. But it doesn't mean uh, necessarily, it doesn't have everything to do with your monetary, uh, your spending, your buying power. It's not all about money. It's humble circumstances, though money is involved there. He says the lowly should boast or glory in the fact. He says, boast in his exaltation. What does that mean? It means that you should boast or glory in the fact that regardless of your lowly status on earth, you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. You should boast in your exaltation. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. You see this over and over and over again in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. He says, Jesus just just right down the line. Blessed is the man who, blessed is the, blessed is the, blessed. Why? Because you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the point. And so James says, listen, to the lowly, boast in your exaltation. It's coming one day. God will increase you. He will exalt you. Get your eyes off your poverty. Get your eyes on Jesus. Your reward is coming. Likewise, the rich or abounding with material resources or wealth, wealth, it tells them to boast or glory in the fact that God, if necessary, will bring you low. Why? Well, in order to preserve you. In order to remind you that wealth is not the point. Wealth is not the goal or the aim. The kingdom is the goal. The kingdom is the aim. 
And the reality is, is, is if wealth is your pursuit, you can lose yourself in that pursuit. And that, that's what James says. The rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. And so wealth is, wealth is not the point. Resource is not the aim. The kingdom is the aim. And so if you're poor, rejoice in the fact that one day your reward is coming. If you are rich and you have, you're, you're in a season where you've been brought low or, you ha- or you're going without, rejoice in that season because wealth is not the point. The kingdom's the point and God is doing a work in your heart. Richard C.H. Lenski said this. He says, as the poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty, so the rich brother forgets all his earthly riches. And by faith in Christ, the two are equals. The two are equals, as the poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty. Listen, you know you can sin in your poverty just as much as you can sin in your riches, church. That's why the psalm, that's why the, uh, the author of Proverbs says, don't give me great wealth and don't place me in poverty so that I don't sin against you either way. Just give me enough, Jesus, to get through. You have people who are, who are greatly discontented in their poverty. And you can sin just as much when you, by having a little as you can with having a lot. You know, people who are in poverty look at those bad rich people. Blame those bad rich people. They've got a lot of money, and so I'm mad at them. Why? Because they got a lot of money and I don't. That's sin. To covet what someone else has is sin. And so you can, you can sin just as easily in poverty as you can in riches. The point, is, the point is not about being poor or being rich. It's about the kingdom. And so boast in the kingdom, no matter what it costs you here on earth. The poor and the rich are the same. These verses have nothing to do with the poor getting rich or the rich getting poor. Rather, it's a reflection on the fact that status must fade in our minds, church, in the light of eternity. Eternity must be our pursuit. Eternity must be our aim. So if we are poor on earth, we can look forward to a time beyond this earth when we will be exalted. After all, we've been made co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs with Christ. I've told you this before. I'm not even going to pretend to understand that fully. What does it mean to be a co-heir of the glory of God? That's yours. It doesn't matter if you have a little on earth. Church, you are a co-heir with Christ of the glory of God. Your poverty makes no difference. Get your eyes on Jesus. If you've enjoyed great wealth, but you find yourself at a time of lack, glory in it. The fact is, God loves you enough to bring you low for a season. Because the kingdom is all that matters. Can you say amen? Verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. What a promise. The crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You see the connection between verse 12 and verses 9 through 11. The trials, whether poverty or riches, the trials. We all face trials. So whether the poor are suffering under their current conditions and they're, they're, they're making sure they're focusing on the future exaltation, their future reward, or if it's the rich suffering under temporary loss and humiliation in order to regain correct perspective, that's all soul work that God is doing in you. It's all for a particular aim. But none of that soul work is going to be profitable for you if you don't choose to be steadfast in it. God wants to do this work, but James is telling us, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Remains steadfast under trial. What does it mean to be steadfast in trial? When's the last time you prayed for the the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Specifically, self-control. When's the last time you got on your knees and said, Lord, help me to bear the fruit of self-control today? 
But that's not it. It's not, one of, it's not really one of those popular prayers. Like, Lord, fill me with your power and your strength and the glory of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to, help me to be self-controlled today. Help me to be patient today. Help me to, help me to love today. Help me to, you know, we, we, we often times we get so, we just little, how many of you know if you shoot an arrow and you're just slightly off at 100 yards, you're going to be really off by the time you hit the target. You're just way off target, right? Sometimes we get into this, this, this lane where we're just like, Lord, fill me with your power and fill me with your glory. Holy Spirit, do a work of the Spirit in me and let me look more like Jesus. Do you know what that looks like, church? Self-control. Self-control. That's what that looks like. Love, joy, peace, patience. That's what the powerful Holy Spirit in you does we 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 glamorize it so i want to i want to go out and shoot lightning bolts out of my fingertips and not in not impressed with the the the, the lightning bolts just not show me some self-control and i'll be compressed i'll be compressed i'll be impressed you know why i'll be uh, i did it again you know why i'll be impressed with a little bit of self-control because i know how hard it is It's tough to say no to yourself. Can we do this exercise? Say, self, no. And even shake your finger, too. Can we do that? Say, self, no. You're like, wow, that's unfamiliar. I don't, I don't do that very often. No, we don't. We don't do that very often. Not nearly as often as we should. Hello? Hello? We must remain steadfast. Steadfast under what? Under trial. That word, that, that phrase, under trial, is the Greek word perasmos, and it means a proving or a testing. How many know that we all have our own proving and testing? And my proving and testing doesn't look like your proving and testing. We've all got a proving and a testing, and that's what James is pointing to when he's pointing to the lowly and the rich. We've all got our testing and our proving. And we have to remain steadfast under those trials. And he tells us, if we remain steadfast, we will receive the crown of life, which, the God, which God has promised to those who love him. The crown of life. What will it be to wear the crown of life for all of about two nanoseconds? Pastor, what do you mean? Oh, we're going to get the crown of life, and then you know what we're going to do? <laughs> We're going to fall on our faces and we're going to throw them at the feet of Jesus because we're going to realize in that moment that he's the only one worthy of a crown. He's, he's going to give us the crown of life, but we're going to say, Jesus, I couldn't even, I shouldn't even have this. This is, there's no way in my self, in my flesh, Lord Jesus, that I could ever have Produce this. There's no effort. There is no virtue that I could have earned or possessed this. It's yours. It is all because of you. It is all because of your blood that I can even have this on my head. And we will cast it at his feet. He's the only one worthy. Amen. And blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. What are you going through right now? Right now, what are you going through? As I ask that question, situations pop into your mouth, into your mouth, into your mind. Might be it in your mouth too. I don't know. Uh, Pastor, I was choking on a mint when you said that. It popped in. What are you going through right now? Hear me, church. Remain steadfast. Get your eyes on Jesus, not other people. Look at Him. Look at the cross. Remember what he's done for you. Stay steadfast. Keep going. Keep moving. Don't give up. Don't give up now. Keep going. There's great reward waiting for you. The crown of life will be worth it. Look at verse 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted. Oh, this is so good. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. 
But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. The topic of temptation. The topic of temptation is often misunderstood. There are a lot of ideas about how we're tempted and and why we find that we are more vulnerable to some sins than we are to others. I want to look at what the scriptures say this morning. I don't want this to be what Rick says or thinks, because what Rick says or thinks, that's confusion. What the Word of God says will bring clarity. Amen? That's what we need. So what of this temptation and sin? Let me ask this question. Can the devil make you sin? Can the devil make you sin? If you are a blood-bought, Holy Spirit-filled child of God, the devil cannot make you do anything. The devil cannot make you sin. I want that to settle in for a second. Because there's a lot of false doctrine floating around out there right now about about how I sin and why I sin and where temptation comes from. The devil cannot make you sin. Now, we we have to give the devil his due for a moment. He is powerful. In the gospel, uh, the the, the epistle of John, the first, first John chapter 5, verse 19, tells us, he says, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Got to admit, that's pretty impressive. However, the Christ follower, the redeemed, the set free, has been loosed from the power of the evil one. Hear me, church. You have been freed from the power of the evil one. Pastor, can you point to Scripture? Yes. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, And you who were dead in your trespasses and under the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. We're no longer dead, but we're alive. We're no longer in darkness, but we're in light. Having forgiven us of all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Can you say amen? This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Look at this. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus has triumphed over the rulers and authorities of this world. Now, he is at this very moment waiting Christ is waiting. You see this in prophecy that he's waiting for the nations and the kingdoms and all authority in this world to be placed under his feet. And one day it will happen. Right now, the God of this world is still having his, having his way. But you, as children of God, brought back to life, he does not, he does not exercise life-controlling power over you. Jesus has disarmed him. Are you following with me here? Jesus has disarmed him by the cross. The blood of Christ has disarmed him. The idea that the devil can make you sin is simply not biblical. And I would go as far as to say it, it allows us, if this, the, the idea that the devil can make me sin, it gives us the open door to Relieve ourselves of the responsibility of self-control and discipline. Well, the devil made me do it. Church, when you stand before God, you're not going to be able to say, the devil made me do it. You're not going to be able to stay there, stand there before God and say, God, I'm not guilty of this. The devil made me do it. It's not going to work. So what about temptation? The devil can't make us sin, but what of temptation? First, understand this. Temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. James tells us it's a process. In verse 15, 
He says, then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Right? And so sin is a process. It starts as desires, temptations, and then it, if, it's, if, if the temptations are given into, it becomes sin. Tempta- to be tempted is not to sin. Sin is to give in to the temptation. And so when we have those moments where our desires and, and temptations are not aligned with Scripture, we have a decision to make. Either, either follow our desires and give in to the temptation or resist those unholy desires and temptations and be obedient to Christ. It's a choice we have to make. No one strong arms us into that choice. It's a, it's a choice we make. And maturity, church, maturity is resisting the desire and temptation before it can even become sin in your life. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll have moments where you're like, you'll either have a thought or a desire creep into your head or your heart, and you're like, no, 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 that's not God honoring. It's at that moment when the Holy Spirit is, has highlighted that, no, Rick, that is not of God. I have a choice in that moment to listen to the Holy Spirit and say no to myself. Or I have to choose to say no to the Holy Spirit and yes to myself. I want you to think about that for a second. You're saying no to someone. You're either saying no to yourself or you're saying no to the Holy Spirit. I would say it is far more beneficial and profitable to say no to yourself. Amen? So where does temptation come from? Well, James tells us that we cannot blame God for our temptations. We cannot blame God for the temptations. God, why are you doing this to me? You can't do that. Scripture clearly says that God does not tempt. He cannot be tempted with evil, and he does not tempt. And so God's off the list. He does not tempt us. Well, can we blame the devil for temptation? Yes, but only in part. We can blame the devil for temptation, but only in part. Let's examine his, his role. It's pretty clear from Scripture that the devil tempts. Right? We see it in the example of Christ. Christ is, is sent by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to fast. And who is in the wilderness? Who is in the wilderness? The devil's in the wilderness. And what does he do? He tempts Jesus. He tempts, it's it. the scriptures say that he was tempted in every manner as we are tempted. The, the, the record of scripture, however, also sa- says that Jesus, while he was tempted, he did not what, church? He did not sin. Now, I won't for a second uh, say that we are as powerful as Jesus. All right? Sometimes when we're tempted, we do sin. Right? I'm not the son of God. I'm not going to claim that we have that much power. Jesus was able to resist temptation, and he sinned not. He was tempted in every manner as we are tempted, but but he was without sin. Now, we can't put that pressure on ourselves because we know it's not possible. But come on, let's resist a little. Oh, I'm human, and so I'm going to mess up. No, 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 no. You're a child of the king. Resist a little bit. So yes, the devil can certain the devil can certainly tempt us, right? He, he he tempts us all the time, but it's our choice to sin, church. It's our it's our choice to disobey the Father. When we again, when we stand before God, we can't we don't we don't get to say the devil made me do it. It's not going to be a legitimate explanation. the The truth is. The deficiency in our own souls is what makes us vulnerable to temptation. It's what God is growing out of us. It's what God is working in us to, to relieve us from. He is, we are being conformed into the image of Christ. It's God's work. It's His plan for us that we are being conformed into the image of His Son. And that's a process. And He's working out the parts that don't look like Jesus. And He's building in the parts that look like Jesus. It's a process. James doesn't say that we're lured and enticed by the devil. He says we're lured and enticed by our own desires. 
So the temptation doesn't come from God. The temptation certainly sometimes comes from the devil. But can we own this morning that most often the temptation comes from within the deficiencies in our own heart, in our own flesh? Oh, he takes, he takes advantage of our weaknesses, but the weakness lies in us. And the world is a buffet of temptation, is it not? There is no shortage of opportunity to satisfy the flesh. No shortage of opportunity. But listen, the devil can't make you do it. You must choose to give in to the temptation. Right now, on the counter in my kitchen is an empty cookie container. It once was full of delicious no-bake cookies. You know, they're so small and they go down so easy. The peanut butter and the chocolate. <laughs> it's empty. You know why? We ate them. Now, here's the problem. I, 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 I have set personal goals to get in shape. I'm 45. i got to start focusing on that a little bit more. When you're 20, you can pretty much eat whatever you want. Right? When you're 45, not so much. And so I've set personal goals. I want fitness goals and health goals. I want to be around for my kids. I want to be able to run around with my grandkids. And I want to take care of myself. Now, was I, did, I exer, did I exercise sound judgment and self-control as I looked around the corner to see if Amy was looking because she knows what my goals are? And then I unlatched the cookie container, and they're small enough I can fit a couple in my hands as I flee into the garage and hide and eat my cookies. Hello? It's a silly illustration, but we do it in our spiritual lives all the time. We don't know how to say no. We've got spiritual goals. God, I want to walk with you. I want to experience the freedom that you provide. I don't want to be controlled by sin. I want to say no to temptation. Yet we give in to ourselves all the time. We dip back. Oh, just one more. Just one more cookie. One, one, one more. What's a serving size? <laughs> None, no sin is a serving size, right? Not that, not that no big cookies are a sin. You understand what I'm saying. We're going into cookie season too. We have to learn to say no to ourselves. The Holy Spirit both empowers and teaches us to say no to ourselves. The Gospel of John Chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus, the, the, the second half of that verse, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Church, Jesus came to give you abundant life, and that includes victory over the flesh, victory over temptation. Now, will we, will we before we leave this earth, will we go like, wow, I don't, I don't face any temptation anymore? No. We're going to have the flesh until we're free from it. How many are looking forward to being free from this flesh? Right? Free from the flesh. What a wonderful experience that will be. But Jesus wants to give us victory in this life. He overcame the world so we can overcome the world. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We are overcoming. We are overcoming. We're saying no. We're becoming more like Jesus. We're, 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 we're exercising discipline and self-control. We're choosing love over hate. We're choosing joy even in difficulty. This is why the, the Apostle Paul admonished the church often to put away the flesh with its passions and desires. Put away that old you that creeps up from time to time. Beloved, if you are struggling this morning with a particular temptation and sin, I want to give you three ways that we can start to overcome. Number one, you've got to shake off the guilt from the past. You need to make a decision in the moment. I'm, I'm done with the regret. I'm done with the guilt. Jesus, forgive me for giving in to my own desires. Uh, help me to be stronger. Ne- teach me to be stronger next time, right? So first we've got to shake off the past because the enemy loves to toy with the past. We need to shake that off. 
That's the first step. God, you've forgiven me. I thank you for your forgiveness now and moving forward. Second, you need to, you need to stop blaming others for your failures. You, you can't, you, it's, your sin is not his fault. It's not her fault. It's not their fault. It's your fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's not God's fault. It's our weakness. We're growing past that weakness. We're becoming more like Jesus. So you got to shake off the guilt from the past, and you got to stop blaming others. you got to own it. And it's okay to be frustrated with yourself. How many have ever been frustrated with yourself? Whoo. You know, it, you know, you're in good company if you've ever been frustrated with yourself because the Apostle Paul was frustrated with himself. We won't go to the passage. You can write it down and check it later. Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about the fact that he is utterly discouraged with himself. He says, the things I know I should be doing, I don't find myself doing. And the things I know I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will free me from this body of death? Who will free me? It's okay to be frustrated. The greats, the patriarchs of the faith were frustrated with their flesh. It's okay to get frustrated with yourself when, uh, you know, from time to time, but you've got to get your eyes on the prize, church. Becoming more like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit are being born out in my life. We need to get serious about the battle in our own minds. What's going on in my head? What's going on in my heart? We need to start praying for self-control. Here's a little common sense shortage of that these days. Stop putting yourself in situations where you're vulnerable to the sin you are vulnerable to. Stop exposing yourself to situations that are going to make you fail. Use better strategy. Put yourself in better situations. Set yourself up for victory and not defeat. Recognize That this struggle is an opportunity for you to grow and become stronger, church. You are becoming like Christ. Remain steadfast. There's a crown of life in it for you. Hello. It's not easy. It's not easy. We we hate saying no to ourselves. And you you live in a culture right now that says it's all about you. All of this self love, remain true to yourself, do what makes you happy. There could not be a more counter-biblical discussion or argument on the planet than be true to yourself, love yourself. It's all about you. The Bible says to abandon yourself. To die to yourself daily. That's what the Bible says. Do what makes you happy. Do what satisfies you. Do it, do it, do what makes you all warm and fuzzy on the inside. Jesus did not come and die on the cross so you could be warm and fuzzy on the inside. Hello? He died on the cross so you can experience discomfort in the life, in this life, so you can inherit the crown of glory one day. That's what, that's what the point is. The crown of glory. And so we surrender to him. We say no to ourselves. Now, We cannot talk about temptation and sin without acknowledging the fact that God in His sovereignty and His wisdom can supernaturally deliver you from the struggles you face. I've seen and heard testimony after testimony, people close to me, I've seen it in my own life, where you've struggled for for some time against this specific temptation, this specific sin, but in this moment you sought the Lord and brothers and sisters gathered around you and suddenly you were free from it, whether it was an addiction to, you know, whatever. Just pick your, your pet addiction. Pornography, alcohol, just pick one. I've seen people get free from it. Jesus comes in and the addiction goes out. I've seen it. Why God does it supernaturally, instantaneously for some, and then others have to learn the discipline of saying no, I don't know why he does it. One way for some and one way for others. All I know is that God is producing a work in each individual life, and he knows what must be done and what must not be done in order to produce the outcome he desires. And so, should you pray to be free from a particular sin? Yes. 
God, help me. You should be praying that every day, remember? God, help me to be self-controlled today. Help me. Help me to say no to myself. Jesus, help me. God knows what you struggle with, church. He knows where you're struggling. Pray. Ask Him to deliver you from it. Ask Him to deliver you in His time because ultimately you want the work that He desires to do to be done in your life. So if that means instantaneous, instantaneous deliverance or a deliverance over time, His will be done. But pray for freedom. Pray for that work to be done in your life. God can do it, and He has done it. Finally, in verses 16 and 17, Do not be deceived, my brothers, my beloved brothers, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Here God's goodness is set in contrast to the temptations we endure. He, the fact that He is the source of all good and perfect gifts. Here James describes God as the Father of lights. It doesn't mean that He's the Father of lights. It means He's the Father of the lights. That our God hung the sun, the moon, and the stars in place. That He breathed planets into existence. That He set the universe in motion. That is our Father. And just as these bodies of lights constantly are ever producing light, good and perfect gifts are ever flowing from your Father who has put those lights in place. He loves you. And He's for you. And he wants to see good things in your life. It does not mean easy. It means good. God is doing a work in you, a constant work in you. He loves you. You know, I think James, I think James places this here because of what he has just addressed. He's, for the, from the beginning of this of chapter until verse 15, he's talking about in, getting through trials and temptation and being, being, you know, counting it all joy and enduring and being steadfast and remaining. And then he reminds us of the goodness of the Father and how all of these good things, all these perfect gifts come from Him. It's this reality about the goodness of God that helps us to endure the struggle, helps us to endure, to fight on, to run the race, as Paul said. Our God is good, and He gives us good things. He is with us. He fights for us. Every day we're getting stronger because the Holy Spirit is teaching and leading us. I'm so thankful for the work that God is doing in me and in you. Amen? Let's let Him work. Let's let Him work. How many are likely going to face temptation this week? Raise your hand if you're going to face temptation this week. It's just a given, right? You know why it's a given? Because you're human. You're human, and you still are clothed in this flesh. One of the greatest promises in scriptures, this immortality must be taken off, and we must be, must be clothed with immortality. That the dying must be taken off, and the, the, the eternal must be put on. What a promise. Um, but until that day, we got to deal with this flesh. we got to deal with... St- I gotta say no to no baked cookies. It's hard. It's hard. We gotta say no. We need to be disciplined, church. You're gonna you're not gonna get it right every time. You're gonna struggle. The point is to keep going. Father, forgive me, help me. Father, forgive me, help me. Father, forgive me, help me, help my faith. Help me to move forward. Help me to be better today than I was yesterday. Help me to look more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. It's a process, and we're all in that process. Amen? Would you take that cup? We're going to take time to remember what Christ has done for us. How many are grateful for what Jesus has done? Where would we be? Where would we be without Jesus? Nowhere. Where were you before Christ came into your life? 
making good decisions. I thank I thank Jesus, Yeshua, for his work in us. Because without him we're lost. But with him we have everything. With him we inherit a kingdom one day, church. We inherit the kingdom of heaven. We are citizens of another place. We are citizens of another city. And one day this place will be will be cleansed and there will be a new heaven, new earth and a kingdom where we will dwell eternally with the Savior. How many are looking forward to that day? You don't get there without Jesus on the cross. You don't get there without faith in the one who died for you. Of all this talk of striving, saying no to self, all this, of all this talk of work that we do need to do, we must remember that when we stand before the Savior, we won't be able to stand there and say, oh God, did you see all that good work I got done? We won't, that won't work. What brings us blameless before the throne is the body and blood of Jesus, and there's nothing else. We can't stand there boldly in out of some virtue of our own or some goodness of our own. We will either be covered in the blood of Christ or not covered in the blood of Christ. That is the determining factor. So if you would bow your heads with me this morning, I would like to invite those who are here this morning and perhaps you have not surrendered your life to Christ Friend, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't know if you'll make it to your lunch destination today. I did two funerals this week. Happened suddenly. You just don't know when life will end. You don't know when the day that you're living will be your last. You simply do not know. But the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. You got to get it done today. Surrender to Jesus. Surrender. What does it mean to surrender to Jesus? It's, it's to say, Jesus, I know that I am lost without you. I am a sinner, and I am on my way to hell without you because the wages of sin is death. But, Father, I know that the gift of God is eternal life, and I want that gift. I desire that gift. The gift of redemption, the gift of forgiveness, the knowledge, the assurance that one day I will be in heaven. When I breathe my last on this earth, I will be in heaven with you. It's not a complicated process. It is faith in Jesus. Faith in the one who died. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in my heart that you came, that you died, that you rose again. I believe in you. I believe that I need you. I believe that I need forgiveness, that I'm a sinner in need of redemption. And I trust you to provide that to me. I ask you to wash me clean. Make me your own. And help me as I walk this earth to walk in obedience to your commands, your words. Help me to live every day for you. Help my life to bring glory to the Father. In Jesus' name. Friend, if you want to know what it means to walk with Christ, at the end of the service, we're going to have elders across the front. I would encourage you to speak with one of them, and they will be honored to walk you through faith, faith in Christ and what that life looks like. Church, would you take that wafer in your hands? The wafer represents the body of Jesus that was beaten, bruised, tormented for us. Would you lift that wafer with me and let's just thank Jesus for his body. Jesus, thank you. We thank you for your body that was beaten and bruised, abused for, for us. We recognize that it was 
on your body, that our sin and our sickness was laid, our shame was on you. As you endured that torment, the beatings, the whippings, as your beard was plucked from your face, as the crown of thorns was forced onto your brow, we thank you. We thank you. Thank you for your body. We remember what you endured and what you went through for us. And we thank you. Shall we partake of the bread together? As I said earlier, when we stand before the throne, you either are covered in the blood or you're not. And that's the difference. You either know Jesus or you don't. That's the difference. This blood symbolizes the blood of God that was poured out to this broken earth, to this broken place. It was poured out for you. It was poured out for me. And so in this moment, we remember the Messiah's blood poured out on that old rugged cross for us. Your word says that our sins, though they be as scarlet, shall be white as snow. You have washed our sins away with your blood. We thank you, Lord Jesus for all that you've done for us. We thank you that heaven is ours because of this blood. Shall we partake of the cup together? Would you just take this moment in your own heart, in your own voice, to just thank the Lord for all that he's done for you what he's brought you from, the work that he's done in your life, the work that he is doing in your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We love you. Would you stand with me this morning, church? And let's pray and be dismissed. If I could have the elders and their wives, if available, to come forward and just uh, be prepared to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're a little short staffed this morning, and so I'm going to ask Pastor Brent and Kelly if they would come as well. Boy, that felt kind of, kind of, felt kind of good. You, you thought you had another week. If you need prayer this morning, come and let them pray for you. We love you, church, and we are for you. And we want to stand with you, whether it's in weeping or rejoicing. We're, we're called on to bear one another's burdens. Amen? And so don't leave if you need someone to talk to and pray with, because we are here for you. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this, this time in your presence this, as we study your word and worship and remember by communion the things that you have done, the work that you've done for us, Lord Jesus, we thank you. Lord, we pray that as we go out uh, into, this, into the world this week, we know we're going to face temptation. But Father, we ask that you'd help us to have self-control. God, there are expectations of love and joy and peace. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in us, the work that you are bearing out in our lives. Holy Spirit, help us this week to give in to the Holy Spirit, to, to say no to ourselves and yes to the Holy Spirit this week. Thank you, Father, that you're for us. Thank you that, that you've called us and set us apart. Help us to turn this world upside down for you, Father. There are so many lost and broken. Help us, Lord, to shine the light, to sow the seed as we go out of this place. Let our, let our lives bring honor and glory to you. In the precious and powerful name 
of Jesus. We all said, amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful week.